we should start our little program. I never use a script because I don't think it's fair that uh, I should know what I'm going to say before you know. But uh, it's very, very easy to be enthusiastic about introducing Dr. Kalani Brady. I'm enthusiastic about the exhibition and we are very grateful to him for his help in, on the Hawaii side and his advice on the whole matter. It was a lot of fun to do all of the show, and it was particular fun in Hawaii. I'd never been there before in my life. I thought I knew American Indians reasonably well, and I'd never been to Hawaii except to refuel and go on the way to Japan. So that was a really an interesting affair. It took a couple of trips to actually, I, I think, get on the right wavelength with these folks. Uh, but as I say, Dr. Dr. Brady was a highlight of that trip. Now the, the island, Talpapa, the peninsula really, of the, of the Molokai Island, is, uh, when you're there, rather beautiful. It's, it's strange because it has rather a very sad history. They'll tell you about it, I'm sure. But just as an outsider, you're not certain what to expect. Uh, firstly, I should tell you as outsiders that the only way to get there, basically, is to fly or swim, if you're an awfully good swimmer. And uh, so, it's therefore, it's rather isolated. These cliffs that look rather pretty in pictures, I guess, are the highest uh, ocean-side cliffs in the world, 2,000 feet. So, essentially, the place was picked because that isolates the individuals who were sent there. They didn't choose to go, they were sent there, and often uh, treated rather roughly, unloaded in the surf, told to go grow some taro, which of course you can't do in the winter. So as I said, very sad history. Uh, I hope today we'll focus on nicer things. Um, the canonization of uh, Damien, for example. I noticed in our, in our notes, I do have one note that I wanted to say correctly. Um, he was beatified according to the, the book that you have, but he actually was canonized at a later date, and that was uh, October 11, 2009. So that was after we had visited, and uh, at least a dozen people from patients from the Kalpapa Hospital were able to fly to Rome for the canonization, certainly a big deal. I was very happy to read about that in the papers, but you have to note that, so 12 or 14 went from that hospital to Rome to see the canonization of this man who, would, who was sainted for work in the hospital, but they all came home. They all came back. Because to them, Kal Kalapapa, Molokai Island uh, is home. And the uh, companionship of the others who have that disease, Hansen's disease is called now, uh, brought them home. So it was an interesting, interesting opportunity for all of us from NLM to see that place, that history, and the, the wonderful work of Dr. Kalani Brady, whom I now introduce to you. No papa va kia iha na uia la kapalilila ho ola i ka manu manu o mauna ala e e ka kapo kama kapo la ka kia me la kuli e e kau kau li oli a kai mala mala mane nei a pau pele i pau ni uku mo he a kai kai lua kai lua kawai hawa pilipu me kalu e ne vai i kawai hai o ka mala na i unu nui. Uanui ki pupu o kuka limo ku me kuka limo e mo ik mau pulu i ke ku e hula po i ku ano i au mo e kala i ka mau liola hele mau lio kala e po haku hele o hula lai oli ia 
Iliu balinu i aloha i aloha i aloha i aloha. Uh, that was my Hawaiian version of the talk. <laughs> That's called an oli uh, or a chant. And basically, uh, oli is used throughout the Pacific to establish your uh, right to speak. I think we'll use the, mic, uh, the uh, mouse. So we're going to talk about Kalopapa. And as Dr. Lindbergh said, Damien, who multiple times said, here I am, send me. Hansen's disease, as Dr. Lindbergh said, is the scientific name of the stigma of a disease that has been around for thousands of years, recorded in the Chinese culture, recorded in the uh, uh, ancient Bible, the Old Testament, and uh, uh, then has been a scourge for the entire two millennia uh, since the Old Testament times. And we have changed the name to Hansen's disease. Uh, to uh, basically remove the stigma of leprosy. Hansen's disease has a median onset today at the age between 20 and 30 years old. Not so was this the case in ancient Hawaii where the onset was at age five or six or seven. When my mother gave birth to me, I was put in a bassinet. She could see me, but oh, she shouldn't touch me. And the, back in the 50s, uh, the contact, the physical contact uh, gave way to a brief understanding that sterility was so important. Unlike that Western medical concept, in Hawaiian culture, before and shortly after contact with the West, the Hawaiians were very physically intimate people. So when there was a birth, the entire ohana or family would cuddle and coo the baby. They would hold the baby. They would tickle the baby. They would pass it on. Auntie would have a chance to hold the baby. Uncle would have a chance to hold the baby. And of course, in the society, as we had the epidemic of Hansen's disease, the way it's transmitted, as you can see here, is respiratory transmission. So uncle would hold the baby <coughs> and cough into the baby's uh, face. And of course, the baby would inhale Hansen's disease bacterium. And in so doing, after a five or six year incubation period, would manifest Hansen's at a much younger age than you see today. The nasal secretions are in fact loaded with Hansen's disease bacteria in untreated patients. Father Damien was accused of having sexual relations with his female Hansen's patients. There has never been any evidence that it's an STD. It was a cruel uh, rumor. The incubation period, as we say, is three to five years. Only three to five percent of the population of the world is susceptible. So if you look at uh, ethnicities like Polynesia, Micronesia, the Philippines, Chinese, Southeast Asians, Indians, they have a much higher risk for uh, susceptibility to Hansen's. Caucasians, fortunately, don't have a very high risk, and we're going to get to that, of course, with Joseph Damien de Verster, who was pure Caucasian. Nope, we're going the wrong way. They look familiar. So the, f what the first name for Hansen's disease in Hawaii was Maipake. Maipake meant the Chinese illness, because what happened was Contact occurred with Cook, and then whalers and merchant seamen started pouring through Hawaii, before the missionaries even. And the ali'i who had means would take trips with these ships. They would go to Australia, to the British Isles, to the United States, and to China. And in going to China, 
uh, because there was intimacy uh, with the ali'i, uh, they would come back and after a certain number of years, they manifested the symptoms of Hansen's disease and it was called the Chinese illness. In the 1840s, the disease became epidemic in Hawaii and therefore uh, there became a fear, not knowing how it was transmitted, that perhaps Hawaii would become this bastion of leprosy. So the Kingdom of Hawaii had a board of health and those physicians got together and discussed and recommended to King Kamehameha V that he establish an act to prevent the spread of leprosy and find a settlement, sometimes called a colony. And so they looked in Hawaii for where that colony was going to be. Kaho'olawe, a remote island, was considered briefly but was felt to be too arid for depositing people for a life sentence and therefore it was abandoned. Kalaupapa, on the other hand, a peninsula on the island of Molokai was chosen not for its geographic remoteness but for the barriers which prevented exit from Kalaupapa. It also had more rain being on the windward side of an island so that if there were adequate rain it was felt like Dr. Lindbergh mentioned that the patients might be able to create this new community and farm taro and have the staple food and become self-sufficient. So in 1865 Kalaupapa was chosen. In 1866 the first 12 patients, nine men, three women, were dropped off and they uh, were on the Kalawau side or the east side of the peninsula. Between 1866 and 1873, nearly a thousand patients were sent to Kalaupapa. Now, here is Kalaupapa Peninsula and it's actually a county unto itself called Kalawau County. Kalawau is the east side of this peninsula and in fact that was where the Hansen's disease settlement was for the first 35 years, 40 years. And the west side was a peaceful fishing village that had been there for hundreds of years and that actually holds the name Kalaupapa. The mayor for this county of uh, Hawaii is the director of health because of course it's a Hansen's settlement and uh, the establishment of uh, the Department of Health. This is the peninsula. You can see this cliff that Dr. Lindbergh referred to as quite an effective barrier uh, for uh, patients that were sentenced to life imprisonment. I keep saying this, well, am I just being dramatic? No, there was no quarantine law in the Kingdom of Hawaii for that matter pretty much anywhere. So they had to borrow the penal code of the Kingdom of Hawaii which was based on British penal code and American Bri uh, penal code. So if you were suspected of having Hansen's disease, you were arrested. And then you went to trial. Your judges were director of the Board of Health members, physicians. If you went to trial and were convicted, and these words were literally used, including with the patients that I take care of today, and they were convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment in Kalaupapa. This is the cliff up close and what you may not see is that right up here on this side of the cliff is the switchback trail that as ascends if you're coming from the bottom and you're trying to escape or descends if you're coming from the top almost 1800 feet vertically. The cliffs actually to the east of Kalaupapa are nearly 4,000 feet in uh, height, a, ver uh, a, a true barrier to any escape. So at the time the Hansen's patients were there, they could either climb that cliff, but if you can see from that cliff, it really is almost vertical. And at the top, one side of the trail was straight down, and the other side of the trail was straight up, and there was a gate placed there. You couldn't go around the gate. You couldn't climb the mountain. And at the gate was a guard with a gun. And if you 
had hiked up that trail, the guard would say, nice job, turn around leper, go home. You could try swimming. It was about eight miles across this, uh, this rocky shore to a place where this uh, cliff diminished to a beach. And if you made that eight miles, theoretically, you might be free. The problem was that my cousins, Namano, the sharks, this is open ocean. And no one in the history, no one is known in the history of Kalaupapa to have successfully escaped by swimming. This is the east side or the Kalabao side. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this uh, beach. This is where the patients were taken and offloaded on long boats. But if you were unlucky, the loyalty of a captain is to the safety of his vessel and to the safety of his crew and passengers. And unfortunately, the Hansen's patients were not treated as passengers. They were dumped, as I will tell you later, into the hold of the vessel. They were treated more like cattle or pigs. And if they made a crossing and it was a relatively calm day, you might say, that's, not, that's calm. Uh, if, they, if it was a calm day, they'd drop the long boats. The patients would be herded into these long boats and rowed ashore by the sailors. If it was not a calm day, which happened not infrequently, the patients would be dumped over the side of the ship and made to swim ashore. And you might think, well, Kalani, you're from Hawaii. All you Hawaiians, don't you swim? The answer is no. So some died. And then, unless you were a really good waterman and could observe areas like that where there are shoals and know from the sea that that was a shoal, you swam in on the rough day and opened your belly on the coral and lava rock. And if you were lucky, you survived that injury. I'm going to tell you a story about Moke. This is a simple slide. Some of you uh, that are wahine, that are female, might find this a bit of a stretch. But I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you that you're imagining yourself to be a healthy, strong, young Hawaiian, about 24, 25 years of age. You see, Moke was raised by his father and mother in a grass hut in Kailua on the windward side of Oahu. And they were taro farmers. You saw Earl Kava'a before in that taro farm. There were taro farms all along Kailua. And his parents worked from before dawn till after dusk, raising the taro, selling the taro, living in their grass um, uh, shack. And you decided, seeing the world expanding around you in the 1860s, that you were going to have a better life. So you, a strong young Hawaiian, faithful to the precepts of your God, you came to Honolulu and you volunteered for a job as a longshoreman on the docks of Honolulu Harbor. The work was hard, but you were 6'3 or 6'4 and weighed 225 pounds and not an ounce of that was fat. You were able to do that back-breaking work and you made loads more than your parents ever made raising taro. And when you had some substance, you brought your wife to become your wife from Kailua as well. Her name was Nani. And she joined you in Honolulu and you even had a place of your own. Not a thatched hut, but a real apartment made of wood. Like the Haoli live. One day you're, walk you're working out on the harbor and a constable comes up to you. And the constable asks you to raise the sleeve of your shirt. Every longshoreman wore long sleeves because they didn't want to damage their skin from the heavy work they had. And you towered over this minuscule constable and you argued with him. Why should you remove your shirt? Did he think that you had stolen something? 
The constable threatened you with arrest. You rolled up your shirt. And the constable was very interested in a kakio, a sore that didn't have any feeling, that had been there for many months now. It was sort of white compared to the skin around it, which was dark. But it caused no pain. You had never paid it any mind. On the spot, the constable arrested you and took you to a place called Kalihi Hospital. Kalihi Hospital wasn't really a hospital like Queen's Hospital had just been formed by Kamehameha IV. Kalihi Hospital was more like wards of beds in a room, maybe 16 to 20. And outside, there was a fence and a gate. You'd never heard of a hospital with a gate and a fence. And you were told that you were to be in Kalihi Hospital until trial. Trial? Trial for what? A day or two later, you noticed that members of the community came to the gate of the hospital and conversed with people who were on your side of the hospital, and they'd walk out to talk to people who were at the gate. And you began to think that Nani would come. Your wife, she had just given you a baby boy and you hoped that Nani and the son would come to visit. Day after day, you waited in vain. They did not come. And then a day came and one of the nurses said, today is your trial. And you were asked to remove your clothes and put a smock on and follow her into a large room with a central pedestal that could rotate like a lazy Susan. And around the pedestal sitting in chairs were a lot of howly men who were doctors with long white coats. And you were put on the pedestal. And they didn't greet you. They hardly acknowledged you. They talked about you as if you were an animal. And then the nurse said, Moki, drop the smock. And you stood there in your nakedness, ashamed. And then one of the doctors came up and started pawing at your earlobes and at your nose and at your lips. Looked at your hands, checked your, uh, your nerves for what he was looking for was uh, enlargement of the nerves. Didn't talk to you, didn't even acknowledge you. And the others came up and similarly examined you. And one reached down and felt your private parts because Hansen's disease in males goes to the cooler areas, including the scrotum. And you were ashamed. You felt sick to your stomach with the shame. And they discussed you for a while, and the nurse then said, you can replace the smock, and you were led from the room. A couple of days later, you were informed that you had been convicted of leprosy and sentenced to Kalaupapa for life. That evening, as if it was with embarrassment or shame that they should even take you, you went back down under guard to the harbor, the very place that you had worked as a longshoreman. You were loaded onto a ship, but not into cabins. You were put down in an open hold where they had taken cattle and pigs out, but not the manure. It hadn't been cleaned. And you and 10 or 12 other patients were put down there, and an hour later, the ship set sail. And the channel was rough. And the smell of the dung was horrible. And soon, the smell of the dung was mixed with the smell of your vomit, because most of you got seasick. In the morning, you could see the gray light in the open holes, and the sea became a little calm. And the anchor was set out, and fortunately the sea was calm enough that they could lower the longboats. You got into a longboat, as did the other patients, and the seamen started rowing to shore. And as they rowed to shore, 
you looked on the shore, this rock shore, and these monsters were slowly walking down among the rocks to meet you. They weren't human. The facial features looked like they had been mauled by the claw of the devil. Many were missing fingers and even hands. One or two had a stick by which they could walk because one of their feet was missing. And with horror, you realized that that would be you. Nani had not come to say goodbye. You had seen someone from your community before you were shipped off. And they shamedly looked down at the floor, at the ground when you saw them and, and waved to them. And they told you that Nani had left the neighborhood. No one knew where she went because the fear and revulsion and shame of having a husband who was a leper could not be dealt with. And the fear was that maybe she would, by association, similarly be arrested. So you were all alone. You had certain death. As the, sh as the boat arrived on shore, you jumped out, even before hitting the stones. And you started running up the shore, away from the monsters. You realized you had been a God-fearing man. You had never stolen. You didn't drink alcohol. You hadn't really sinned in your whole life. You had pursued a dream to make better of yourself and provide for your family. And this was the way God treated you. And you glanced heavenward and raised your fist and said, Damn you, God! And you cracked. And you, who had been such a righteous man, transformed. Can anyone blame you? Moke became one of the ruffians of Kalaupapa. What that means is that because he still had his strength, and because God had abandoned him, the next boatload had women. He grabbed one. She became his sexual slave. And the next boat had children. And he grabbed one of each. Ten, twelve-year-olds. And they became sexual slaves, slaves to carry water. Sometimes, actually, in that era, the children would willingly become the slave of a strong man. Because only about a third of the patients had houses. And after living for a month or two in the wind that was described earlier, 30 mile an hour wind, relentless, day after day, night after night, no trees to block the wind. After a while, a little boy or a little girl would decide it was worth trading their backside for being in a house with a bed, no matter what else might happen. And that was the hopelessness, the despair, the debauchery, the orgies, the drunkenness of Kalaupapa of the early 1870s. Some years before, in the 1840s, a man had been born in Tremolo, Belgium. This man, Joseph de Verster was his name. He was born to a family of landed farmers. They weren't just serfs. They actually owned their land. Quite successful. Joseph had an older brother, Pamphile. Pamphile was one of these slender, book-learning type that could be presented perhaps as one of those people who would argue how many angels fit on the head of a pin. But you, Joseph, was different. 
Joseph was stocky. He was shorter than his brother. In fact, as he grew up, his family began to think, you know, Joseph is going to be the head of this farm family, the next generation. He will continue our fine tradition, animal husbandry, carpentry, all the things that you needed to know to be in the country. When Pamphil came to his parents and said, I feel called to the priesthood, they, a devout family, rejoiced because here was a member of their family who had received a calling to the priesthood. A sister of Joseph similarly felt a call to the convent and again the family rejoiced. Not so when Joseph came to the family and his brother having had such a good experience in the early time of this seminary in Paris, France of the order of the Sacred Hearts of Joseph, I'm sorry, Jesus and Mary, he came to his family and he said, I feel called. And they despaired a bit. But they were not going to stand in the way of God. So off he went to the same seminary as his older brother. He got there and Pamphil had spoken German, Belgium, Fle Flemish, French, and he knew Latin. So the, fa uh, the priests who were teaching uh, in this seminary to become a priest thought that Pamphil was the best that they could have. And it was almost by contrast, Joseph came and his intelligence was more a practical intelligence. He wasn't a theorist. He could build, but he only knew Flemish. Haltingly, he knew a little Latin. Back in those days, of course, you didn't learn Latin because the mass was all forward and away from the congregation. He knew no French. He knew no German. So they watched him for a couple of weeks and said, you know, Joseph, you should become a choir brother. We don't feel you're called to become a priest. We feel you're be ca called to become a choir brother. Oh, okay. A choir brother was obviously a member of the choir and sang. That puts me in that category. Not very smart. But the choir brother also emptied the night pots and they peeled the potatoes and they cleaned up the kitchen after the meal was done. They had a lot of menial duties. So he humbled himself and did that. And then came time for his brother's ordination as a priest. And Pamphil was assigned to the mission field in this place called the Sandwich Isles. But he came down with typhus and nearly died. They had a real problem. But Joseph stepped forward and said, Here I am. Send me. They thought, they talked about it. They debated. But they decided to send him. And in October of 1863, he boarded a ship in Bremerhaven. Five months later, he went around Cape Horn and arrived in Honolulu. He went to a school called Ahui Manu. It's now St. Louis High School, where I went to high school. He was there for a couple of months. He was ordained a priest. And when you're ordained a priest or uh, when you're... Uh, become a sister, you're allowed to take a name, usually of a saint. He chose Damien. So now jo Joseph was Damien de Verster. And for seven years, he worked the mission field on Hawaii Island. First, he was in Kau and Puna, and then in Kohala. And he used to race the Protestant, uh, uh, pre, uh, the Protestant uh, um, Kahu uh, to, or, uh, to baptize the most people. Well, for those of you that may know Hawaii, on the island of Maui, the Catholic high school is called St. Anthony's. Well, St. Anthony's was actually a church associated with the high school first, and it was built in 1872. And in 1872, Bishop Mike Gray, the missionary bishop of the Diocese of Honolulu, gathered as many priests as were able to come, went to Maui, and celebrated this new church.
St. Anthony's Maui. And he told the priests a very horrific tale about a group of people in a desolate place called Kalaupapa in which there was no hope and no peace, no leader to call them back to the Lord. There was only drunkenness and orgies and sexual slavery. And so he asked, will someone please volunteer? And I need four volunteers. Will someone volunteer to become the priest for three months? And we'll put you on a round robin. So you only have to do three months of hard duty. And then you have nine months where you're back on, in your church or parish or on the mission field. And then we rotate you once a year. Again, Damien was the first to stand and say, Here I am. Send me. Three other priests volunteered as well. I work in a news station for 16 and a half years in Honolulu on a morning news team. We don't always get it right. Damien went to Kalaupapa. The news hit the papers. Hawaii at that time was the second most literate place on earth. Can you believe it? Had higher literacy than the United States and England. Scotland, ironically, was the most literate place on earth per capita, and Hawaii was second. The news hit. Damien, the Catholic priest, sacrifices his life for the people of Kalaupapa. And it went on to describe the desolation, the sin city, and how Damien was volunteering. And of course, once you were there, it was life imprisonment because no one knew how it was transmitted and you couldn't be sure that Damien wasn't incubating Hansen's disease. Well, the news hit and the bishop was beside himself. How could he, anything he did at that point looked like he was going back on a commitment to these poor people. What happened? Did Damien decide he didn't like it enough? So he went to Damien and Damien went to him and Damien volunteered to be the permanent priest of Kalaupapa. Damien became the defender when he was there. He first got there and immediately became the protector of children and women. He went into private houses of these bullies like Moke. He snatched the children out of the house. Damien was this tall. The Hawaiians were this tall, twice his weight. I'm amazed they didn't kill him. But maybe it was the collar. In any case, he had a ragtag group of orphans with Hansen's disease that became his wards. He gave the women, adults, the freedom to follow him and protect them as well. Some of them did. Some of them did not. He began ministering especially to the sick and dying immediately. He held them, bandaged their wounds. He took up a pipe so that the smoke from the pipe would drown out the putrid smell of the ulcers and the abscesses that these patients had. Being a carpenter, he dug the graves, built the coffins, and buried the dead. Hadn't happened before then. So. When he did this, I'm Kalani the Barbarian. Some of you may know that the Catholic Church requires two miracles for canonization as a priest, as a, a saint. My two miracles are these. Damien came to this place and members of my Protestant church read the news. And in a day when Catholics and Protestants were at each other's throats on a Sunday, the elders and deacons of Central Union Church, which was where the capital of the state of Hawaii is now, three blocks away from Our Lady of Peace Cathedral, marched down Britannia Street, named for Britannia, uh, England, and marched into the Cathedral of Our Lady of Peace. Can you imagine the bishop looking up and seeing what he knew were the Protestant leaders of that town 
and wondering why they're at Mass. What happened that was so wrong? Was there going to be a conflict? And the Protestants sat down in the front. And when the offering time came, they gave what one history book describes as the largest offering that had been taken in a while. And there was peace because of Damien in his ecumenicism. Well, that's okay. But most of Kalaupapa saw this person as an outsider. He's not one of us. He's one of them. How can he preach to us seeking forgiveness? How can he preach to us about being meek? He doesn't have this disease that will kill him five years from now after it has made a monster out of me. The second miracle of Damien occurred and was noticed after Damien had snuck up the trail. Somehow, again, maybe it was this collar, but he regularly snuck up the trail to Topside and built three churches on Topside Moloka'i. And somehow the guard just let him by. He came down one time. He came down, he went to his meager house. He poured a bucket of hot water because his feet were sore. That trail is very, very rough. I've been down a dozen times and been up 20 or 30 times and it's very rough. He put his foot into the water. Put his other foot into the water. <laughs> he lifted his foot immediately because of the pain of the scalding water. It took him a second to realize as he lifted the other foot out that had been in there a while and looked down at the skin that was falling off the flesh that he had second degree burns of his other foot. The next Sunday in the church that you'll see in a second he preached a unique sermon. He started and shortly after he started he said we lepers and a few women were paying attention the kids weren't but the few women that were paying attention said what is he talking about? What gall does he have to call himself one of us? He doesn't walk our walk. He's not one of us. Twice more in the sermon, he talked about we lepers. And then he lifted up his trousers and showed them the leg with the skin falling off the flesh. And they knew. It was at that point in 1883 that there was a change in Kalaupapa. Damien was transformed from just the protector of a few ragtag kids and women and comforter of the death of the dying. All of a sudden he was one of us. And being us instead of them, a new respect occurred for Damien and an increasing number of Kalaupapa patients fell behind Damien in a walk toward forgiveness, toward humility, toward grace and acceptance. I won't disnify it and say that Kalaupapa lived heavily, happily ever after. I have living patients who have told me that they were molested as children coming in the 1930s and 40s. I know patients that are drunk every night. But might no longer makes right. And Kalaupapa is a very faithful place. And every Sunday, almost everyone is in church. And they live that throughout the week. The second miracle of Damien was that God gave him the dubious gift of becoming like those to whom he ministered. The people today in Kalaupapa see him as a spiritual father. Some of them believe that they have communed with him, that he has come back and spent time with them. So of course when he was beatified, as Dr. Lindbergh said first, 
and then canonized later, there was no question about our Saint Damien. This is the church Saint Philomena into which Damien came, which at that time had been built by Brother Bertrand in 1872. Damien, uh, as you can see on the left side of this photo right here, there's a, uh, another part of it. This huge church came after Damien's time, but it was a little chapel in this configuration, uh, and then Damien came and built it out on this side so that it became like this is the church by the time Damien came because he built this part. This is where he was buried in 1889 and where part of him is still buried. I used to give a talk similar to this to many different groups, including the Hawaiian Civic Clubs. And I got a good scolding from the Hawaiian Civic Club of Honolulu, from my aunties and uncles there. They said, Kalani, you have no pictures of the graves. Kalau Papa is all about the 8,000. Where are the graves? So I went out and took a bunch of pictures like this. But you have better pictures here at NLM than I have. So they came to me in 2008. They said, Kalani, three of them, we're going to Rome. Are you going to Rome? And I said, no, no, I, I think I'll just stay here and watch it on TV. I'm really a barbarian. And I had it was like I had insulted their mother. And they recoiled and they huddled like a football team. And I thought, oh no, I'm in trouble. And one of them was appointed and stood in front and said, Kalani, you're our Kauka. We're going to Rome because Damien is being canonized. You are going to Rome because you have to take care of us. And so here is the group that Dr. Lindbergh referred to. These are most of the remaining Hansen's patients in 1999 in Kalaupapa that went to Rome. Almost all but two required wheelchairs. And this is in front of the altar of the Basilica of St. Peter in the Vatican. The woman right here is the living miracle, according to the church. This is the reason he was canonized. This woman, I don't know if you know how the process goes, and I do have a minute or two more. Uh, the, 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 the canonized saint must have two honest-to-God miracles. This is Audrey Toguchi. She was a graduate of the sister school of my uh, high school, and she was a teacher for her whole life. And she had a chest x-ray. She had a chest x-ray. Um, and the chest x-ray showed a mass. And her doctor sent her to a pulmonologist. And the CAT scan that they did showed a well-defined cancer of the lung. They did a bronchoscopy and got brushings. And sure enough, it was a cancer. So this cancer, um, the protocol was to remove all of the cancer if you could. And uh, then start radiation and chemotherapy. The pre-op chest x-ray, the day before the surgery, flat screen, uh, just PA and lateral chest x-ray, was taken. They actually thought it was the wrong patient. They checked it and took another one. There was no mass. She had gone to Kalaupapa, she had prayed to Damien, and the mass was gone. No explanation for this. It was a significant three to four sonometer mass. That's the reason he was canonized right there. So after being in Vatican City in Rome, we came back home. And this is just to make you jealous. This is where I get to go every week and live a couple days. This is the uh, water at Kalopapa. Uh, it's better than most aquariums you could visit in terms of uh, diversity and volume of fish. Mahalo means thank you in our language. This is an aerial of the settlement of Kalaupapa. And I would be glad to take your questions uh, if you have any. And if you don't, I have an uh, encore.
if you don't ask a question, I'll have to go on to the other stuff. So we want a question. The medications were used. There were many treatments that were unsuccessful, as you probably know. Uh, the question was, what is the treatment for Hansen's? There were many uh, treatments that were used. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, colorful was Chalmugra oil, which was an oil extracted from the Chalmugra tree, which was injected subcutaneously and used to itch and burn like fire. But because Hansen's had remissions and exacerbations, Enough patients somehow went into remission with Chalmugra that they misunderstood that it was actually effective, which it was not. The actual drugs, the sulfones, started being used in 1948 here on the continental US. They didn't come out to Kalaupapa until about 1950. Uh, and of course, there was a great distrust at first as to whether they were going to be effective. We had no magic potion. And it was very hard to grow uh, Hansen's disease bacteria, Mycobacterium leprae, in the lab, you have to use armadillo as the host or humans and the human growth. Actually back, uh, there is a story, a true story about one of the kings of Hawaii that allowed a killer, a uh, convicted murderer, to be experimented on in the late 19th century because, uh, so they injected Hansen's disease uh, flesh or uh, inserted Hansen's disease flesh into this person to see if they would contract Hansen's. Well, of course, they didn't because we didn't know at the time, but there was this three to five year incubation period. So 1950s is the short answer. The stigmata of Hansen's, once they're there, they're there. So it's very interesting. Um, you can put them into remission like you do with tuberculosis and occasionally you'll get a reactivation. In the last eight and a half years that I've been there, there have been three reactivations. Uh, those patients are now dead but not of their Hansen's. Um, the, uh, so the stigmata, of course, include the things that I talked about with uh, Moke, which uh, actually happens to be my brother's name. Um, it, it includes uh, loss of the earlobes and the eyebrows and frequently the nose and mouth become a single hole and sometimes there's an autotracheostomy. Sometimes there was a therapeutic tracheostomy because the patient couldn't mobilize their secretion successfully enough to not be in respiratory distress. So a, so a number of my patients in getting there as children told me that they thought they were going to the Wild West because they'd seen the black and white movies of the Wild West. Everyone wore a bandana. And they went to Kalaupapa and everyone wore a bandana because they had tracheostomies. And then the worst, of course, were the auto amputations of the fingers and the toes and the feet and the hands. Uh, patients would play piano without fingers. I have a patient that's still alive today that plays the piano better than I do. Uh, and I, well, I don't play very well. Uh, but uh, it, the, you know, the combination of the neuropathy, which is a complete numbness of the digits and toes, and therefore the occurrence of infection, and then the decreased immune response that they have because of Hansen's and the Hansen's vasculopathy led to abscesses getting out of control and amputations certainly before the age of antibiotics. But I have a patient in the hospital for osteomyelitis right now uh, because of uh, uh, a serious infection that developed without the patient's knowledge. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. We'll get you to talk about the susceptibility of Pacific Islanders uh, to the disease. How often do you see new cases? How often? Excellent question. How often do we see new Hansen's cases? Uh, cases? We actually have uh, cases that come into Hawaii, not on a daily basis, but certainly on a weekly basis and they're successfully treated as outpatients and they never see Kalaupapa. Kalaupapa is of historical significance for the 8,000 that were there and for the fact that they were sentenced to life in prison there. Um, the new patients, of course, are treated just like we have immigrants uh, that have tuberculosis. We treat them, we inactivate the tuberculosis, they live as outpatients in the community. Yes? The overall population is about 100. There are 19 Hansen's patients, 
At any given time, about half of them, I'm the medical director for both Honolulu and Kalaupapa for Hanson. So at any given time, we may have eight to 10 in Honolulu, or we may have two to three in Honolulu and the majority in Kalaupapa. They all have homes in Kalaupapa. Uh, so they bounce back and forth. Uh, of the remaining uh, 80, about 30 are healthcare workers and other state employees like myself. I actually um, provide the care with a hui of doctors, one of whom is covering me now. Uh, as a faculty member of the University of Hawaii School of Medicine, I fashioned a contract between the State Department of Health and the State uh, of Hawaii uh, Johnny Burns School of Medicine, so they pay the school for our time. And uh, then a remaining 50 are employees of the Na Kalaupapa National Historical Park. And they uh, do restoration of buildings so that maybe in 20 years, it'll be like the Presidio in San Francisco. Sir? Yeah, I'm Francisco C. from the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. I don't have a question, but I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. There are two other sites in the world that I know of that similar to what you, you described. And one of them is in Carvai, Louisiana. This is a National Hansen's Disease Center here in the mainland. And when I visited that about 10 years ago, there are still a few living uh, leprosy patients there uh, in that area. And actually, in the main hospital where they have them, half of it is where they live, but then the other half actually uh, is where the white criminals are, are our, our place. The other place that I could think of is in the Philippines where I'm from, and there's an island called Cebu Island where there's a Leno, uh, memor uh, place called Lenawood uh, Center where they also used to house these uh, leprosy patients. But they're not as beautiful as this islands that you described. <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually there are leprosaria in many, many countries of the world. As you uh, mentioned, National Hansen's Disease Branch in Carvel holds a monthly audio teleconference, and I, am, I frequently call in because I'm not a specialist in Hansen's, I'm a general internist. And so I take care of these Hansen's patients for their diabetes, renal failure, dialysis if they need it, congestive heart failure, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and that kind of thing in which I've had training. But uh, the Hansen's Disease Branch in Carvel hosts uh, educational fora every month. I have actually personally visited, last November, um, I visited the Tahiti, Papaete Tahiti Leprosarium, which is actually a, a village like ours in a valley, and it's very unassuming. So if you don't know where to look, you'll pass it on the, around the island road. And, um, but I drove up in there, saw their cemetery. Actually, it looks more organized than ours, the ones that you saw. And uh, the people looking out, um, as I slowly ba drove back down from houses on each side of the street were clearly Hansen's patients. So there, and Samoa also has a leprosarium because a couple of our patients originally were in Samoa. Yeah, so they're probably scattered all around the world. Uh, there, some of our Hansen's patients, because they were American, uh, were activists. And they formed um, self-help groups and activist groups for Hansen's patients of the world. Bernard Punikai'a comes to mind. Henry Nalai Elua, who has a book, comes to mind. Uh, and, the, and both of them have books, actually. And these people fo uh, moved the cause of patients suffering from Hansen's forward. And uh, uh, so they, t they write about visiting uh, leprosariums in India, in Africa, in South Korea, in Japan, in addition to the Philippines. Yeah. Just to re remind us that the, the idea of leprosy moving into the medical sphere now as opposed to a curse out of the Middle Ages or the Old Testament is pretty recent. I mean, uh, Clem asked about the treatment. I was taught as a student at Columbia Presbyterian, that wonderful font of knowledge to you <laughs> shall move oil. I mean, it's all pretty recent. And the growing of the bacillus, which is essential to, to any kind of reasonable treatment, I really think could first be credited to Charlie Shepard at CDC, who grew it in the mouse pads of mice. 
it likes cold places, as you pointed out. And I don't think it ever occurred in CDC to try, maybe they later tried the armadillos, but I know that now that's the way it's used. But it was a, a desperation move to try to do anything. And of course, it doesn't grow well in the footpads of mice, but it grows a little. That was, a, I think, the first real breakthrough. But we want to hear your, your follow on. Oh, OK. Boy, I hope you don't regret this. Part of what we can learn today from Kalaupapa is a lesson in cultural competence. And it's one of the core measures these days. Every residency teaches it. Medical schools teach it. Obviously, we have an entire Department of Native Hawaiian Health with which uh, Dr. Lindbergh is well familiar at the John A. Burns School of Medicine. We are the first of the 130 some odd medical schools in the United States we are the first to actually have an, a, a department that addresses aboriginal health, a, a health of a host culture. So what are these? You've heard of Stonehenge? This has nothing to do with Stonehenge. <laughs> these are the foundation of the Federal Investigation Station. This was a well-meaning initiative that went horribly awry. In 1893, Queen Liliuokalani of the Sovereign Kingdom of Hawaii was illegally overthrown by American uh, troops with a mock revolution. I say that, people ask me, well, are you a rabid Hawaiian? Uh, aren't you American? I'm a, a, a descendant of the second president of the United States, John uh, Adams, and uh, uh, four of my ancestors founded Harvard College. So I'm very proud to be an American, and I want to say that right up front. But we all know the historical mistakes that we as an American people have made at times. Well, the merchants, two of which were prominent members of my church, who led the overthrow of the government, Thurston and Dole, Sanford Dole, um, immediately started petitioning to have Hawaii annexed and Grover Cleveland, the president, who was friends to several of the royalty of Hawaii, blocked congressional annexation. But then he lost office to Milt McKinley. And McKinley did not have the same ties. And so Hawaii was successfully annexed as a territory in 1898. Well, Damien had been a prolific writer, and there had been others. He wrote to kings, he wrote to popes, he wrote to bishops, he wrote to nobility in Europe, he wrote to everybody that was a big merchant in the United States. My poor lepers, my lepers are suffering. They don't even have enough houses for them. Can you please donate money for my lepers? Hawaii at that time had a real PR problem. There is in Congress, a uh, record of the um, Congress debating whether all the lepers of the United States should be sent to Hawaii because, after all, it was 2,300 miles from the closest land. It's the most remote archipelago in the world. And they didn't realize in that map of Hawaii that you saw that all of Hawaii wasn't just full of lepers because of people like Damien. And it was only this two mile by two mile triangle of land in which all the lepers lived. Well, they tried to um, reverse this PR problem and Surgeon General Walter Wyman determined that a concerted and scientific, this was the age of science, the dawn of science, scientific attack on leprosy should be made. In 1904, President Roosevelt uh, recommended a hospital and laboratory to study, given the 850 plus cases in the territory, almost all of which were in uh, Kalaupapa. And in 1905, Congress appropriated $150,000 to build this place. $150,000 110 years ago was a heck of a lot of money. And they built this huge facility that went on for a quarter of a mile. It wasn't as big as the NIH, but it was pretty big. And they said, you can eat on China. You can have crystal glassware and silver forks and knives. 
you will be taken care of impeccably. You will have the highest standard of living. The only thing, we're going to use the scientific method, so you must be isolated. Hawaiians were a social people. The physical and social intimacy of the culture uh, 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 survives today. And so they asked for volunteers. They had spent what today would be millions of dollars. Of the thousand people in the settlement, they had nine volunteers. It was opened in 1909. It was closed four years later unsuccessful in its mission. And some years later, the buildings were all torn down to build enough houses for everybody. The, the key here is we can have the best science, as most of you know. But if we don't temper that science with the art and humanity of caring as nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, social workers, physicians, and other health care providers, we miss the boat. So how do we learn that? Well, here we are in Kalaupapa, one of the leading, this is the head of the patient council, is teaching our students about cultural sensitivity. She's telling the Mo'olelo that I taught you today, the stories about this place. So by the time they graduate, about two-thirds of all the medical students of the University of Hawaii at Maanoa have been to Kalaupapa for a rather rugged experience. Um, similar, but even more rugged because we had trouble with a tree when Dr. Lindbergh came. He stayed overnight and saw Kalaupapa, of course, as did many of the team here from, from NLM. But they come, they spend a couple of nights, they see the back country where we are now, they hear these stories, and hopefully they learn between the curriculum of the medical school and the on-site curriculum that we have uh, to be more culturally sensitive. Another important uh, agenda is the one that the National Library of Medicine has led with the Voices exhibition here. This is a picture on the right. Whoops. On the right, this is Emmett Aluli, who you saw in the video. On the left is probably the greatest La'au practitioner, Native Hawaiian herbal healer in the last century. In today, in Hawaii, La'au practitioners trace their learning genealogy to a kumu, to a teacher. And the most successful uh, La'au practitioners all trace their genealogy to this man, Papa Henry Awai. And Emmett Aluli and Papa Henry are here offering both sides of healing because Western medicine doesn't have all the answers. So this truly is a new era, health and hope for our Hawaiians. Mahalo. follow your lead. If you have questions, I'd be glad to answer. If you have private questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Just, what's the future for Kalo Papa? Is it turn into state or a national park? Where would you use historic status and the residents all over there? A very uh, important question, treated very seriously by the uh, national parks. Um, the Kalo Papa National Parks have led discussions on each island with representatives of the Hansen's patients at each of these discussions and collated a great deal of material about what the communities of Hawaii should uh, feel should happen to this place. Uh, what we don't feel that uh, I'm sort of a mayfly. In 20 years, my job will be done. And Kalaupapa is a very, very special place. And I've had the unique honor of being there when there has been a living community. When the living community is no more, 
my place will no longer be there. However, there is discussion about should it be like the Presidio of San Francisco, a monument to what happened. Kalaupapa National Historic Park is attempting at this time to create that kind of thing even while it's a living community. Should it be a resort? Should, uh, and the answer uh, by almost everyone is absolutely not. The land is owned by Crown Lands, what used to be Ali'i Lands. So uh, should it become uh, Native Hawaiian uh, uh, homelands, which is administrated by island, by the uh, people who administrate homelands? Some one of our leaders here at National Library of Medicine at lunch was talking about how they lived right next to Hawaiian homelands in Papakulea on Honolulu side. But the answer of that question, uh, ha, the answer ha, to that question has not been determined yet. I think no major development is what they say is a caution. I think Dr. Brady would be happy to talk with you at a social hour. You are all invited to that social hour. Rob will describe how you find your way and we'll have, we'll fix it so you won't get lost. You're all invited. Please join us. Do you want this? I think I'll use the other one. Oh, okay. Yeah. For those of you who are visitors to NLM, uh, the, we decided to have the reception at the Native Voices exhibition just outside of it. That's in a different building. And so what we're going to do for all of you who would like to go to the reception, who do not know how to get over to the exhibition area, just gather right out here in the lobby and we'll have a group of people that will escort you over there. Okay? And we'll gather out there in about five minutes. Is that, is that agreeable with everybody? Okay. We'll see you outside right out here in about five minutes. <laughs>